Hello, welcome to today's Healthline webinar from the American Association of Kidney Patients titled Cancer Risks and Kidney Disease. My name is Erin Kale and I am AAKP's Director of Patient Insight, Data Analytics and Advocacy. I oversee our patient research and education activities as well as our grassroots engagement activities including our ambassador initiative, which comprises highly motivated and engaged patients, caregivers, and living kidney donors around the country and the globe. AAKP's Healthline webinars fall under our Center for Patient Research and Education. We believe patient and caregiver education is an integral part of treatment and protection of patient lives, and we work to ensure that the patient has a central role in research and guidance that are designed to determine optimal approaches and strategies for providing healthcare services, assistance programs, and access to new products and services. This is especially true during national emergencies, such as the coronavirus pandemic. We built this center with the latest polling and engagement technologies to ensure that kidney patients take a central role in informing the federal, academic, and private sector research, shaping the next generation of healthcare services, assistance programs, and innovative new treatments. And we encourage you to respond to our flash surveys and other engagement opportunities. At this time, I'd like to introduce Paul Conway, AAKP Chair of Policy and Global Affairs. Paul is a kidney transplant recipient of over 25 years. And Paul will go over the data that we gleaned from a recent AAKP flash survey. Paul? Hey, thank you very much, Erin, and Happy New Year to all of our uh, viewers. Uh, we take a special pride at AAKP in putting on webinars like this, and Aaron has done an absolutely fabulous job with the rest of our team uh, throughout the COVID crisis, raising different issues. Today, what we're taking a look at is another issue that's of particular interest to patients, but one that we think is often overlooked uh, in the patient community and also among medical professionals, but it's a very important issue, and that's the issue of cancer. Uh, we're going to go over a couple of different slides here that give you context for how patients uh, view the issue of cancer and how they've been approached in terms of preventive uh, education and strategies. On this first slide, uh, we asked patients what their understanding was of risk based on counseling that they had received. And the good news is 43% of the patients had received some type of counseling about what the risks were. But the thing that we're focused on right here is the number of kidney patients that have not received any type of counseling about their risk for cancer, and that's at 51%. Again, largely one of the reasons why we're doing our webinar today. So in this slide, what we're taking a look at very specifically is what people can do to prevent cancer or reduce their risk. And in this one, for example, kidney transplant patients, I know this well, a transplant patient of 25 years, if you're out there and you're a transplant patient, have you been asked or have you been uh, given guidance on what you can do to prevent cancer? In this one, it was positive that 55% had received advice on it. However, this number of 43% not having gotten any type of advice or recommendation for prevention is very important. And I think it's one of the issues that we as a community need to address. And that's what the webinar today is for. So on this is trying to assess the general awareness of uh, cancer within the community and among patients and specifically on diagnosis. We asked the question, if folks had been diagnosed with cancer while on dialysis or after getting a kidney transplant, about 25% say yes, about 55% say no. That 24% is a pretty significant figure and one that uh, a lot of education needs to be done around, we think, uh, for the rest of the patient community or those who are about to enter dialysis or who are contemplating a transplant. And here it's, again, awareness of other patients besides uh, oneself. And you see that about 21%, about 20% of the population of patients uh, know someone else on dialysis or with a transplant who's had a cancer diagnosis. The good news is 75% don't. And then here it's an assessment of uh, people's knowledge of cancer risk. And on this one, we're asking individuals who are on dialysis or transplant recipients, if they think that they're at higher risk of developing cancer in comparison to the general population. Over half, 65% say yes, but 34% are uncertain. And again, it's these figures, people who haven't been talked to and people who are uncertain about risk of cancer that we're trying to get to. That number's at 34%, people that just aren't sure. And then on this one, uh, I know that Dr. Blosser, our guest today, will be able to address this 
and this is the perceptions that people have on whether it's true or false, that having cancer is an eligibility issue when it comes to receiving a kidney transplant. About 57% believe that's true. Those who are not certain, 36%, and those who think that's false is 7%. Again, another question that uh, provides a basis of a lot of education for today. And on this one, this is another issue that's very important. About 25% or about a quarter of the population would know what their options were if they were to receive a diagnosis of cancer. But somewhat alarmingly, uh, over half of the patient population would not know what their options were. And again, Dr. Blosser will get into this. Uh, this is why we think it's a very important issue. Lack of knowledge about the risk, lack of knowledge about your own situation, and lack of knowledge of knowing what your options are. This one is very interesting to us for the policy implications. And what we're basically asking here is if a patient is diagnosed with cancer, a kidney patient is diagnosed with cancer, what are their options in terms of care choice and the experts they can consult with? AKP has been a very strong advocate of telemedicine and access to experts, especially during COVID-19. But in this one, we're asking if you're a kidney patient who's been diagnosed with cancer, should you have the right, should you have the ability and the option and the care choice of being able to seek expertise in another state uh, and to be able to do it through telemedicine? Clearly, 96% of those patients that participated in the survey said yes, only 1% said no, and again, 3% are uncertain. The reason why this is important is because right now, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Assistance are considering the issue of telemedicine flexibilities that were established during COVID-19, and the Congress is also taking a look at telemedicine legislation. AAKP has a very large voice in this, and it's one of the reasons why we're so very pleased that Dale Rogers, our secretary of our board, and Dr. Blosser are here today to talk about this because if you're diagnosed, you wanna make certain you have access and the care choice to the best expertise possible. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dale Rogers. And Dale is the secretary of the board of directors for the American Association of Kidney Patients. He's a patient ambassador, he's a good friend, but probably his driving passion is to educate other people because Dale has walked the walk and talked the talk and he knows what it's like to fight kidney disease. He's very passionate about making certain that people have the education they need and the choices because Dale knows full well what it's like when people don't have all the information and don't have all the choices. And that's why he works with people across the country and in rural states to arm themselves with the information they need. So Dale, you go ahead and take it away. This webinar was your idea. You've done a great job on getting all the materials together and everything and with your good friend and caregiver, Dr. Blosser, I know it's gonna be a success. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. It is my pleasure to join today's webinar about a topic that is important to me as a kidney transplant recipient. I have received two kidney transplants and a pancreas transplant in the last 22 years. AAKP is the largest independent kidney patient organization founded in 1969. Membership is free to kidney patients family members, and living donors. One of our major principles and distinctives in the field of advocacy is the support of patient care choice. And that, and that means that patients need to have the care choices they need to support their aspirations. We believe that patients who have cancer should be able to have access to experts they need to take care of them. We support CMS telemedicine modifications that have been made during COVID-19. And we hope that many of these continue. We are advocates for expanding cancer care coordination through telemedicine and remote care. I'd like to introduce our guest speaker of today's webinar, Dr. Christopher Blosser. Dr. Blosser is a transplant nephrologist and clinical professor at the University of Washington with expertise in the clinical experience and roles of the immune system in cancer and kidney disease and organ transplant. He leads a first of its kind multidisciplinary cancer and organ transplant clinic 
COTC at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center that offers in-person and telemedicine based consultation involving both cancer and transplant specialists <clears throat> customized for each patient patient. Additionally, he is the director of the UW Center uh, for Innovation, Cancer and Transplant, CICT, which is focused on understanding and solving the significant challenges faced by organ transplant candidates and recipients with cancer. The CICT is the coordinating center of the only patient level national bio registry that enables collaborative projects across three interconnected dis dimensions of research. A, patient reported outcomes, B, epidemiology, clinical data, and C, trans translational applied basic science in clinical settings. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Blosser, as he has been my nephrologist for 12 and a half years. And I can attest to how much he cares for kidney patients like myself. He personally helped connect me to kidney patient advocacy that led me to AAKP. Dr. Blosser, thank you for joining us today. I hope you will share a bit about your personal connection to kidney disease. Thank you so much, Dale. It's a true honor to be a part of this and, and to talk with you today. Um, why don't we get started on the slides because I, in, in Dale's invitation, I would like to start with um, a bit of my own story. So before I start with my own story, I, I do have a few disclosures to share with you so that we have a, a transparent conversation. I have research funding from the Cooney Foundation. I have been a consultant for Notera and continue to be an editorial board member for the American Journal of Transplantation. Before we get into some of the risks about cancer in the setting of transplant, I do wanna share a little bit about me. I know this conversation should not be about me, but I want you to know that I have a serious invested interest in the lives of people who have kidney disease. This is a photograph from when I was a freshman in high school. And in this picture are my mother to my left, as well as her sister, my aunt, sitting on the couch, along with my grandparents and great-grandmother and my siblings and father. In the black and white photo to our right is my mother's mother, who she knew for a few years before passing away at the age of 36. Only later did we learn that my grandmother, who I never knew, along with my mother and my aunt, had polycystic kidney disease. I grew up with my mother experiencing kidney failure, living on dialysis for about five years before receiving a kidney transplant when I was a freshman in college. My aunt had a similar experience and each of them had their challenges that it has included cancer. So coming to this conversation, um, the personal experience and the understanding of how important trying to prevent and then uh, treat in a timely way with the best expertise is, is really important for, for my approach to my patient care, as well as the research and education that I offer. The first thing I want to name is that we have been successful in a number of areas of transplant care, including keeping people alive longer before transplant on dialysis and keeping people alive longer after transplant. Now, I appreciate that that quality of life is something that we need to continue to improve too. The success, unfortunately, has led to an increased risk over time, both before transplant and after transplant, so that people who have organ transplants, like kidney transplants, are two to four times higher risk for cancers compared with the general population. When we think about that in a patient-centric perspective, that means that people with an organ transplant are 10 to 15% risk of developing some type of cancer over 15 years on uh, immunosuppression for their transplant. That's higher than with dialysis, but unfortunately dialysis and kidney disease also have a higher risk than the general population. We know that the chronic kidney disease risk for cancer is about 16 to 20%. And for those people who have lived on dialysis 
that percent of risk increases more towards 30 to 40 percent risk. And, and I appreciate that those are all concerns that we need to continue to address in the midst of living the best lives we can in those situations. The most common cancers that we see both on dialysis as well as after kidney transplant are related to what we call immunoresponsive cancers, cancers that typically the immune system can control. The most common ones are skin cancer, labeled non-melanoma skin cancer and Kaposi sarcoma. These are cancers of the skin that typically are controlled when the immune system is healthy. But when dialysis leads to inflammation or immunosuppression suppresses the normal function, those cancers can develop. Other higher risk cancers include lymphoma, and after transplant, that's called post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease, or PTLD. In addition to that, kidney cancer, anal cancer, which is an, honestly another form of a skin cancer just around the anus, are more common. You'll see at the bottom of this list the most common cancers in the general population of prostate, breast, colorectal, and lung cancer. They are higher risk in our population, yet they're not as high risk as some of the others, and that's because those cancers don't have the same immunoresponsive risks. So I'm going to think about some of these cancers that are higher risk and how we can both prevent and treat them. Some of the risks that you may be aware of, and some of which are obvious, include as we age, our immune system isn't as strong, and our cells, each of them can develop abnormalities in the genetics that then lead to the chance for that, can that cell to turn into a cancer cell. And when it's a cancer cell, it doesn't have the same restrictions of growth. Other comorbidities like diabetes and end-stage kidney disease also increase the risk of cancer. We know that tobacco use increases risk of cancer. And people who have cancer before transplant have more risk of cancer, both that cancer coming back as well as new cancers developing after transplant. Immunosuppression naturally suppresses the normal immunosurveillance of cancer. And we know that there's always been a concern of whether certain kinds of immunosuppression are an increased risk by themselves. The only clear data we have to suggest that there is an increased risk with a specific medication is an IV medication we use called antithymocyte globulin, or ATG. That's typically used at the time of transplant to help really decrease the immune's reaction against, the immune system's reaction against the organ transplant to prevent early rejection. And if there is rejection, we use it at times to, again, treat that rejection. But for the maintenance therapy, there is no evidence that medicines like tacrolimus or cyclosporin or mycophenolate increase that risk. And honestly, it's a matter of how much time someone needs to take immunosuppression that we know is an ongoing risk. There is a group of medicines that we use at times called mTOR inhibitors, including serolimus and everolimus, that have shown signs of decreasing the risk of skin cancer. And squamous cell carcinoma, or SCC, is the most common type of skin cancer. So there are, there are times when people have recurrent skin cancers that I will switch over to serolimus or everolimus if that person is able to tolerate it in order to try to prevent future skin cancers and even try to treat the ones that they have. The problem with immunosuppression is that, like I mentioned, it suppresses the normal immune function. The immune system is designed to look around the body for cancer along with infections. And if the immune system finds it, the goal is to kill it. In addition to the surveillance task, the immunosuppression unfortunately decreases ability to react against oncogenic viruses. Those viruses can get into a cell's genetics and change the genetics in ways that increase the risk of different kinds of cancer. And this is a list of some of the more common viruses that can lead to cancer, including hepatitis B and hepatitis C causing liver cancer, in addition to HTLV causing lymphoma, a certain type of herpes virus, herpes 8, causing Kaposi sarcoma and lymphoma, more commonly Epstein-Barr virus or EBV that causes mono can then lead to developing lymphoma and other skin cancer. And human papillomavirus or HPV can cause different forms of skin or oral related cancers as well. So the more we can know about these and when possible vaccinate before transplant, the more that that person is at lower risk for it. Unfortunately, there's a lot we still don't know about for risks and that includes risks for underrepresented minority groups. 
So one of the goals that I have with our center of research is to study the risks, both risks unknown for everybody and risks specifically for underrepresented minority groups. Unfortunately, when someone has a higher risk of cancer, that leads to a higher risk of death. Not every cancer causes death, but some do. And those cancers that have a higher risk of, of death include lymphoma, kidney cancer, and melanoma. The more common general population cancers also can, including lung cancer. If we can catch it early, there's a much better chance of being able to treat it. I mentioned earlier that people are living longer and we've been doing better with controlling and, and managing cardiovascular disease and infection. And the consequence of that improvement in overall healthcare is that cancer is now the second leading cause of death, meaning that it is increasing as a cause of death just because cardiovascular disease and infection control has improved. Now we have a task to do better at screening and prevention of cancer and then treating when we find it. In the last year, I undertook a study where I looked at whether there has been a change in the incidence, meaning the frequency of cancer and the outcomes after cancer for kidney transplant recipients in the US over the last 30 years. And the reason I wanted to do this study was because we are seeing great improvements in cancer screening and cancer care in the general population. And I wondered whether that improvement was applied and reflected over time in our, gen in our kidney transplant recipients. We were able to study over 100,000 kidney transplant recipients in the US over the last 30 years. And we looked at the seven most common types of cancer. Unfortunately, we found that there was no improvement in the frequency of overall cancer and of six of seven of the most common types of cancer, including colon, lung, breast, kidney, melanoma, and lymphoma. So people are still developing those cancers at about the same rate that they were 30 years ago, despite improvements in the general population. So then we asked, are people experiencing less death or kidney failure in the midst of cancer? And we found that only lymphoma has improved, and thankfully so, especially because we know that lymphoma causes death to a greater extent. And so the treatments for lymphoma, including a medicine called rituximab, have been very effective in decreasing that risk of either graft failure or death. Unfortunately, all the other cancers have not improved in outcomes in the last 30 years. And one of the many questions that came up with this is why? Why are people who have kidney transplants not experiencing the same improvement in their outcomes when they have cancer compared with the general population? Part of this is because the screening for cancer after transplant and even before transplant with dialysis is challenging. We know that people have lots to take care of in their lives, including attending dialysis or going to appointments, taking their medications on time. Also, because cancer screening is complicated and it takes a lot of studying to make sure that the right test is used at the right time for the right patient. We don't want to increase the burden of stress or give an inappropriate diagnosis of cancer when it's not there. So for now, the appropriate cancer screening for people who are either on dialysis waiting for a transplant or already have a transplant should include the same as the general population with breast cancer screening for women ages 50 to 74 with a mammogram at least every two years, cervical cancer screening according to age, colorectal cancer screening is now ages 45 to 75, and lung cancer screening for people who have smoked the equivalent of 30 pack years and are between the ages of 50 and 79. Beyond that, then we also need to consider looking out for skin cancer. And so skin cancer screening means having an annual evaluation with a dermatologist or another informed provider that is specifically looking across your entire skin for any possible type of skin cancer. And that's because squamous cell carcinoma, the most common type of skin cancer, is 160 times higher risk after transplant because of the immunosuppression. I will highlight that this is not just for light skinned people like me, but everybody, no matter what their skin color, is at a higher risk of skin cancer and should not only then have that annual skin cancer screening, but also use um, SPF 30 or higher sunscreen, wear sleeves, a hat, especially in direct sunlight, but even in these cloudy days in Seattle, 
being covered helps to prevent that risk over time when one goes outside. There are higher risk populations, and for people who have had a pre-transplant cancer, we need to be more attentive to the risks that they could develop it after again, or a new cancer. If they have a strong family history, that would be concerning. If someone receives a kidney transplant from someone who had Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, while they have not had a memory for that virus in the past, that would be a higher risk for lymphoma. And every transplant program is required to test for that at the time of transplant and then follow for that afterwards. And that would be something you should be aware of. Finally, someone who has hepatitis B or C has a higher risk of liver cancer and should be followed for that. Now that's different if the hepatitis C is treated or if there's no signs of the virus that has grown in the blood, but be aware of that even so. So I mentioned earlier that the tumor, say on the skin, should stimulate an immune response. And what that means is that certain parts of our immune system would pick up little proteins from the tumor and travel back to a, a nearby part of the body called the lymph node that is basically like a headquarters for different immune cells to interact. And those cells that come back to the lymph node give signals to T cells. T cells are cells that have a major job to respond to tumor and coordinate a larger response. And so in a normal situation, those T cells would go back to the tumor, attack the tumor, and kill it. Unfortunately, in the setting of immunosuppression, many of those things are not possible, in, at least in the same way. So on the left, there's a decreased number of those cells that can notice a tumor to begin with, and so there's a decreased amount of tumor surveillance. Additionally, the immunosuppression leads those cells that normally would attack those T cells that would normally attack the tumor to be sleepy and therefore not attack the tumor as strongly as possible. This is, goes also for viruses. And so the same risks that we're talking about with cancer are why we have a higher risk for COVID or other viruses with immunosuppression. There are other parts of the immune system that are intended to dampen an immune response so that it doesn't get too aggressive and cause inflammation when it shouldn't. And those cells actually increase in the setting of tumor so that overall, there's unfortunately a greater chance that the cancer can grow without control and the effects of course cycle on their own. We know that with transplant immunosuppression, our goal is to, to basically control the immune system, much like a muzzle on a dog. And I have a great dog and sometimes he, he doesn't wanna control his, his own uh, tendencies. And so our immune suppression is, is basically to, to control those cells in the immune system that would attack, in this case, the transplant. But we also know that this immunosuppression leads to inability for the immune system to respond to a cancer. We've learned that over time. And because of that, there are great new therapies called immunotherapies that are intended to wake up the immune system to intentionally attack a cancer. And those uh, immunotherapies include immune checkpoint inhibitors and CAR T cells. The immune checkpoint inhibitors are basically antibodies that are given to a person that take the brakes off the immune system so that the immune system can then more aggressively attack a tumor. The CAR T cells are somewhat modified cells of the person that are then targeting against that tumor. And we'll talk about each of these separately. Unfortunately, the immune checkpoint inhibitors or ICIs are not precise in their treatment against the cancer. And so many people develop side effects from the medicines. That can include most commonly a skin rash, diarrhea, sometimes other side effects, including everything from the brain to the heart to the kidneys. Now I name this because it is possible, but thankfully the immune checkpoint inhibitors have been better tolerated and more effective than historic chemotherapy. And so more than 50% of people in the general population who have a cancer will be treated with an immune checkpoint inhibitor if possible because of the effectiveness. Unfortunately, when it comes to transplant and cancer at the same time, there's conflicting goals. The transplant requires immunosuppression to prevent rejection. The cancer does best if it has active immune reaction to attack the cancer and try to kill it. I recently, worked with a number of team members here at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center to look at the outcomes for people who were treated for their cancer with a checkpoint inhibitor after an organ transplant. I saw that there were some really effective treatments, even while on immunosuppression for people 
who had some type of cancer. And the ones that were most effective, you'll notice with the blue arrow, are pointing on the right side at the cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. 68.2% of them actually had a response to the cancer and basically considered a clinical remission. That's a remarkable positive effect. Unfortunately, that's not the case for every type of cancer. The HCC in the middle only saw about 18% effect and melanoma about 35. That is reasonable and better than previous therapies, but still we have a lot more to do to improve. We also looked at the risk of rejection with these treatments because we know as we wake up the immune system against the cancer, it can cause rejection. And unfortunately, it can cause rejection quickly. So that 63.6% of people developed rejection if they were going to within a month of starting the checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So my advice when thinking about whether to use this therapy to treat cancer, and typically this is an advanced or metastatic cancer, is to consider one's goals of life and then be prepared for the possibility that the organ transplant, maybe it's a kidney, maybe it's a liver or heart, that one might experience rejection within a month or at the latest two months and be prepared for what that could mean, including needing to start dialysis again. I'd like to use a case to discuss that for a minute. And this is an 83 year old man who I care for who came to our program with high blood pressure, atrial fibrillation, Addison's disease, which is where his adrenal glands are not making enough steroid and chronic kidney disease. And part of his chronic kidney disease was because he had a kidney cancer and required removal of his right kidney in 2010. At that time, there was no evidence that there was local invasion, meaning it did not spread beyond the kidney and there was no signs of metastasis. And so he had a kidney transplant with us six years later after waiting more than an appropriate five years and got that in 2016. Unfortunately, three years later, he developed neck and back pain and we diagnosed him with metastatic recurrent kidney cancer. So he underwent a fusion of his spine and also radiation to different parts that had the cancer. And then we asked the question with him, what would be the best total body treatment, chemotherapy or immunotherapy, to try to achieve the best outcome for him? He was wondering whether or not using an immune checkpoint inhibitor, which is very effective against metastatic kidney cancer, might work for him, knowing that there is a greater risk of rejection. So in, in October of that year, we went ahead and started pembrolizumab, which is one of these checkpoint inhibitors, along with another medicine that typically is paired with it called axitinib. He developed some side effects with the axitinib, the headaches, the gout flares, and the hoarseness, yet has done remarkably well. I do want to highlight that this work is in part because of some amazing research that has been applied over the last years by two scientists that won the Nobel Prize in 2018, James Allison and Tezuko Hanjo, because of their findings of how the immune system works with checkpoint inhibition. For my patient, when he decided he wanted to start the immune checkpoint inhibitor, we wanted to give him the best chance of response against the cancer while preventing rejection. And so I switched him from tacrolimus to serolimus because of some early signs that that would be a better option to achieve those two goals while continuing him on a low dose of the other immunosuppression medicines. So he's continued on both of those medications. Uh, he did continue both of those medications and then stopped the axitinib in July of 2020 because of the side effects while continuing on the immune checkpoint inhibitor through now. And you'll notice that his creatinine has remained relatively stable. There's been no signs of rejection. I also have continued to use a number of other tests to look for rejection, including donor-specific antibodies, which have been negative, and the cell-free DNA test, looking for any signs of inflammation or potential rejection in the circulating DNA of his blood. And thankfully, that's been normal too. So for some people, that is effective. Unfortunately, for others, they can experience rejection or other side effects. And so thankfully, there's even newer therapy options coming forward. And the general concept is called CAR T-cell therapy or chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy. And the idea is if someone has a cancer, to remove blood from, their, from that person, identify this, the T-cells from them, and then insert a gene that is specifically sending a message to create a receptor, a protein on the surface of that T-cell that will target the cancer and that specifically that patient's cancer, not somebody else's, but that patient's. So then those T cells are grown many millions and then reinfused 
to the patient. Those cells then can attack the cancer more precisely with less side effects. And we're seeing that that is remarkably effective, especially in people who have lymphoma or other circulating blood cancers. We are continuing to study the possibility of using this type of technology in solid tumor cancer. And even in the last week, a remarkable study was published in Science Magazine using this technology to treat heart attack in a mouse. So it's possible that this idea could be applied much more broadly while also being precise, but we're not there yet. So for now, and I think forever, the goal really should be personalized medicine, where we're addressing the question of what is the cancer type? How extensive is this cancer? What types of biomarkers can we use to follow both the cancer as well as kidney care and health? What are the current treatment options and what are the off-target effects or the side effects of those medicines that we need to be aware of? What other comorbidities or other kinds of health challenges does someone need to live with? And keep that in mind as we finally and fundamentally try to address the person's health and life goals to guide our treatments. That really should be personalized medicine. Before we think about some of the ways that I've tried to approach this, I wanted to use this example. This is a study that was done in 2017 where people who had kidney transplants were asked, would they give up years of their kidney transplant life in order to avoid or decrease the risk of cancer, death, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, depression, and other side effects of life. And what stood out to me in this study is that people were interested in giving up more than three years of kidney transplant function in order to avoid cancer. And even more striking was that they were willing to give up more years for cancer than they were for death. So cancer continues to stand out as a major concern for people. And I, I appreciate that we as providers owe it to talk about that with our patients and then focus on both prevention and when necessary treatment. So if we have some type of cancer, we need to make some adjustments either to immunosuppression or to other care. And for those who are on immunosuppression, we need to adjust the immunosuppression medicine according to the type of cancer and how extensive it is. There are certain cancers where we really don't need to, to decrease the immunosuppression because there's not much of an immune system effect, like breast, thyroid, or prostate cancer, I'll continue the immunosuppression. But for other cancers, including as you see going from left to right, colorectal, bladder, lung, squamous cell carcinoma, and even more increasingly melanoma, kidney, and lymphoma, I will decrease or even stop immunosuppression as we treat those cancers. And that is to give the best opportunity to achieve the best cancer treatment while also trying to prevent rejection. If we're using a checkpoint inhibitor, like I mentioned earlier for my patient, I will convert someone from tacrolimus or cyclosporin to an mTOR inhibitor like serolimus if possible and if tolerated. I will use a higher dose steroid to try to decrease some of the inflammation around the treatment early on and then decrease that further because I know that prednisone and any steroid has long-term effects that we wanna minimize. Try to avoid medicines that can also amplify the risk of the side effects, including proton pump inhibitors for, for heartburn, NSAIDs like ibuprofen, and antibiotics. All of those I try to avoid or stop if I can. And like I mentioned before, if checkpoint inhibitor therapy is going to be started, consider whether you would want dialysis before starting the treatment and then make plans because if rejection will happen, it will happen early enough that it will be hard to anticipate and respond later for that to work well. So with those considerations, I have developed the Center for Innovations in Cancer and Organ Transplant with the goal of developing an interlocking approach to healthcare research and education. And that education should be bi-directional, meaning I want to offer education to patients while also being educated by patients and with them so that we can do better together. The center includes both the clinic, the cancer and organ transplant clinic that is held at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. The SCCA is the clinic part of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. While also we have the Center for Innovations that does all of the research work as well as the administrative interactions with and integration with the clinic. The clinic is what we, under, what we understand to be the first of its kind multidisciplinary consult clinic where people who are organ transplant candidates or recipients who have cancer will be offered the chance to address their concerns with the right providers. Some of the unique questions that we answer include when 
someone can proceed to an organ transplant in the setting of cancer? Should that be after waiting a certain amount of time, or can that be even while they're being treated? What are the optimal treatments for their cancer in order for them to be a future organ transplant candidate? And then separately for those who already have a transplant, what are the optimal cancer therapies and immunosuppression management to help that person thrive? In partnership with the Fred Hutch and the SECA, I've pulled together team members, oncologists, surgeons, transplant experts for this twice a month half day clinic, which we started in September of 2021. We receive referrals from anybody, meaning patients or providers, gather the data, schedule the appointment, see the person, and then we are able to typically see three new patients per clinic along with a return visit as needed. This can be done in person here in Seattle or by telemedicine. Unfortunately, the current restrictions on telemedicine limit our extension only within Washington State. I'm, I'm really hopeful that we can offer this resource across the country in the future. So we, like I mentioned, can receive referrals within or outside of the UW system. The way that the clinic runs is that in the first hour, the patient sees one of the providers involved say it's an oncologist for their cancer. In the second hour, that same person would see a transplant physician related to their transplant situation. And in the third hour, after all the providers have seen each patient, the providers meet to discuss each patient and then come back with a personalized recommendation to those patients one at a time. And we record those recommendations with an audio recording and send the person home with a thumb drive of that recording so that they can ask their questions both in that time, but we also know that many questions come up after that and they have the chance to think about the questions with that recording and send follow-up questions. Of course, we also send our referral recommendations back to the providers involved. Any cancer treatment or immunosuppression adjustments, we talk with those providers. This is the website you're welcome to look at and it includes the ability to request an appointment for yourself. These are some of the providers I've recruited to participate. We have. Uh, 14 oncologists across various cancer types. Almost every cancer is addressed here within this team, along with organ transplant providers across kidney, heart, lung, liver. So we really want to provide a comprehensive and integrated approach to care. At the same time, we know that our clinical care right now has its limits and we, we need to learn more and understand those issues enough that we can improve people's lives in the long run. So the Center for Innovations has the vision to build cancer-free transplant solutions in partnership with patients. And the more tangible mission is to transform lives through integrated healthcare and research for people with cancer and organ transplants. We have three main aims in terms of our multidisciplinary research. And in order to do that research, we are establishing the only patient level national registry of people before and after organ transplant who have cancer so we can understand those issues at the patient level. The patient reported outcomes um, is a part of that, but just want to highlight that we will be the, the data coordinating center here at the University of Washington and we'll be inviting people as patients as well as collaborating scientists and clinicians from various cancer centers and transplant programs around the country to participate by submitting their data and then also being able to apply for collections of data to do f future studies. So you can imagine as we grow this network that the more people who participate, the, the larger the reach and the bigger the outcome improvement can be. So as I mentioned, we are going to be approaching three different types of research. In this case, the epidemiologic or clinical data research is going to be focused on risks and outcomes of people who are treated with various types of therapies, including the checkpoint inhibitors. And we're going to be specifically attending to how people do when treated with cancer and comparing those who are underrepresented minority groups compared with the general population. Additionally, we're going to be doing patient reported outcomes research, asking people to fill out surveys of their life experience and social determinants of health, meaning where they lived, what their education was, their access to healthcare and good food, along with the experience of structural and institutional racism and the impact of all of that on cancer and transplant outcomes. And finally, we'll be doing translational work, meaning asking whether or not the genetics and the immune system's markers that circulate through the bloodstream or on a tumor can help us best predict which treatment to use or to avoid in order to achieve the best outcomes. Our team 
is focused on having the patients at the center. And we have a three phase area of, of organizational structure, including the scientific advisory committee and the community engagement committee, each comprised of both experts and patients in different ways that then advance our agenda together with our team. So in summary, we know that kidney transplant recipients and even those on dialysis are living with a higher risk of cancer. And that risk is about two to four times higher than the general population. Skin cancer is the highest risk around 160 times higher risk. And unfortunately, cancer is the second leading cause of death. But I think we can do better with comprehensive screening using general population guidelines, along with attending to higher risk situations, including for people who have had a cancer before a transplant. Checkpoint inhibitors and other immunotherapies, I think will be increasingly used and potentially effective, but we have to be careful about the risk of rejection when using checkpoint inhibitors. And that's where partnering with cancer treatment experts like oncologists, along with palliative care when appropriate, so that all of our life goals and health are the focus when treating the cancer, managing kidney disease, and keeping our lives the best we can. So I'm going to stop there knowing we have a few minutes left, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with all of you. I cannot do this work without you, nor can I do this work without other team members here at the University of Washington and the Fred Hutch. So I'll stop and uh, hope to take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Blosser. That was a great presentation, a lot of important information. Uh, we thank everyone who submitted questions to us for this webinar ahead of time, and we will address some of those now. Um, if you are unable to get to, if we are unable to get to your question during this webinar, you can reach out to us at info at aakp.org and we'll work with Dr. Blosser to provide a response. So let's get started here with some of those questions. What are the most common types of cancer for transplant recipients and the best preventative techniques to reduce chances of getting those cancers? And are there specific screenings other than the usual mammogram and colonoscopy? I hope I addressed some of that in our conversation so far. Skin cancer is definitely the highest risk. And so using sunscreen, SPF 30 or higher is best sleeves, a hat, whenever someone is going out is a really good idea. In addition to skin cancer, lymphoma is a possible cancer that one has to watch for. And typically if, if someone is going to develop that kind of cancer, they'll develop symptoms that are like having a flu or another illness, but that doesn't go away. And if it doesn't go away, then it's definitely worth looking into more closely with your doctor. And then if it's found, we have the opportunity to treat pretty well with rituximab or other related therapies. Beyond that, I think um, each cancer de deserves its own conversation, but I hope that um, you've got a general concept that working with your doctor for screening purposes and continuing to keep an eye on the risks together will be the best. Thank you. When reviewing labs, is there an area that individuals should refer to that might help um, be helpful in catching cancer earlier? And are there biomarkers available for monitoring organ rejection and cancer risks? At this time, there are no great biomarkers or lab tests looking for specific cancers. And that's an area of specific interest that I have. As I mentioned in the case that I shared with you, I do use donor-specific antibody testing and cell-free DNA testing to look for rejection in someone who has a transplant, but that doesn't necessarily address all of your concerns related to cancer. So for now, I think we can continue to, to grow our knowledge. Um, and the best that one can do in addition to the, the screening is to live a healthy life healthy diet, regular activity, the best that you can will help to prevent those risks. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of individuals uh, watching the webinar who um, are on immunosuppressive medications. Um, is there anything that they can do to protect themselves from cancer? Would something like a, a monthly IV medication instead of pills uh, reduce the risk of cancer or an intravenous, um, some other type of intravenous uh, anti-rejection drug? 
Unfortunately, there's no evidence that most of the immunosuppression medicines um, would increase or decrease that risk, like I mentioned. But the less total immunosuppression that someone can be on while still preventing rejection is better. And so I, I would again suggest that having a conversation with your transplant doctor, your nephrologist, whoever's helping manage your immunosuppression to minimize those, the immunosuppression medicines, doses, as much as safe is, is the best way to prevent cancer. I know that we're all living in a, in a world where we have to balance risks and we want to prevent the rejection of the transplant while also prevent future cancer. Thank you. Um, if you, um, sorry, one other question here. Um, how long does a patient, does a person that had breast cancer have to stay on the inactive wait list for a transplant? And I imagine that um, would probably be, um, you know, specific for that person, but do you have any um, insights into that? Yes, the waiting time for breast cancer, like any cancer, is going to be depending on the type of breast cancer and the stage, meaning the extensiveness of it when it was found and treated. We have thankfully better treatments and also better knowledge about the risk of that cancer returning so that the waiting times have typically shortened over the last five years. There have recently been some new guidelines that have been published in the last year on those waiting times. And so what you could do, if this is you, is to talk with your provider and look at those waiting times. They were published in the American Journal of Transplantation in the last year. And there are specific tables reflecting what is recommended for waiting time, depending on the cancer type and stage. Great, that's helpful information. And we'll try to, to provide that link for individuals to, to check that out. Um, one additional question we have here before we let you go. Does hydroxychloroquine cause uh, skin cancer? This individual has had numerous uh, squamous cell and basal cell carcinomas. I'm sorry to hear that. No, I'm, I'm not aware that hydroxychloroquine causes skin cancer. You may, if it, this is you, you may have also been treated with other immunosuppression medicines, and it would be more likely that those other immunosuppression medicines played a role in your skin cancer. Um, hydroxychloroquine is a relatively tolerated uh, medicine without that risk. You do want to watch out for um, eye disease with it, but otherwise no, no evidence of skin cancer or, or even other cancers that I know of. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Blosser. We really appreciate your time today. Um, thank you to Dale for, um, for inviting you to be part of this webinar and suggesting this topic. It's very important and um, we greatly appreciate you spending so much time with us today. Again, if anyone has a question that we did not get to during today's webinar, please reach out to us at info at aakp.org. We hope you have found this webinar very informational and we would like to close with a few um, additional slides with resources that may be of interest to you. If you are not already a member of AAKP, we encourage you to join. AAKP offers free membership to patients and family members as well as living kidney donors. You can join online or by phone. And in order to receive all the benefits of membership, please be sure to include your email address when signing up. You will be notified by email when opportunities arise where your opinions and experiences are needed to help inform innovation, advance care, and make a meaningful impact to improve lives. We encourage you to respond to our flash surveys and other engagement opportunities to help us elevate the patient voice and change the status quo for kidney disease care. You can also select to receive any of our five different electronic newsletters and subscribe to our print magazine, AAKP Renal Life. We also invite you to follow us on our blog and social media for all of the latest news and announcements. AAKP is dedicated to helping patients understand their condition and take control of their health care. We are proud to offer a variety of resources for both patients and caregivers. 
by visiting our website at aakp.org and clicking on the AAKP store button at the top of the homepage, you can find a variety of educational brochures and online tools to order or download. And you can also order materials by phone. We encourage you to visit our on-demand webpage where you can find educational sessions from our previous events, such as our Global Innovation Summit, Annual Policy Summit, and National Patient Meeting. And stay tuned for dates and registration information for this year's signature events, which will all be held virtually. We also have a plethora of resources on our coronavirus resource page that we regularly update. We'd again like to thank today's speakers, Dr. Christopher Blosser, Dale Rogers, and Paul Conway for sharing information about cancer risks in kidney patients and preventive measures. We hope you will continue to be informed and stay safe. Thank you all for joining us.